Um, this first flash piece uh, was recently uh, appeared in Columbia Journal, and it's called Blind <coughs> Date. I enter Rusty's place on the Lower East Side and claim my usual table in the back. I'm reluctant to meet the stranger I met online in a bar, especially a girl like me who hasn't dated anyone since my traveling circus days, but my confidence is soaring, and I don't know why. You wouldn't know why either if you saw me. I light a cigarette. My doctor says I should quit smoking, but I can't. Rusty's place is the only public spot I'm comfortable in because people don't stare at me, and Rusty is a gem. I'm about to chicken out, but I have an obligation to fulfill. Rusty comes over and offers me gin. I shoo him away. I say, I'm waiting for someone. Don't cramp my style. Just give me peanuts. He acts surprised. You're meeting a guy? Not just any guy, I say. Snarky 2000. Smoke rings happen. He's got black hair like shoestring licorice, I say. I tell Rusty I met Snarky2000 online and we've dated for months. I tell Rusty that I love Snarky2000. I love him so much even though I never met him. That every time he comes online my heart goes ping. I'm in love with the screen name, I said. I'm in love with the concept of online dating tucked inside that little black font. As if this quells any fear about meeting someone in the flesh in a bar. Besides. I'm not technically meeting him in a bar, I'm meeting him at a bar. There's a difference, I say. Whatever you say, Rusty says. I have been searching for love forever. I am desperate for companionship. But whenever a man gets too close, he runs away. Snarky 2000 doesn't know what I look like. No photo, he'd said. He was satisfied with just my phone number because he got off on my voice and mine was a sweet one. He thinks I'm 230 pounds thinner than I am. What he doesn't know is I'm a 360 pound knockout. I told him I'm an office assistant. I didn't tell him I applied for a job as an exotic dancer at Rusty's because I didn't get hired. I asked Rusty if my busting the pole out of the ground had any bearing on his decision. Maybe I swing too low, too slow, too fat kid, he'd said. The door at Rusty swings open dramatically, ushering in a breeze. The happy hour crowd shuffles in. I down three bowls of peanuts. A shadow cuts a figure in the light. It's him. He orders a beer and asks Rusty something I can't hear. Rusty winks and nods in my direction. Snarky eyes the joint, but skims past me. My table in the corner smolders in a soft gray haze. Pinball machine bells go bling and bling. The place reeks of stale barley and hops. Rusty leans over and whispers in Snarky 2000's ear. Snarky 2000 searches the room. His eyes skip over me, then back again. He picks up his drink. He's headed my way. As he steps closer into the light, I see his hair black and swept back over his head, greasy and stiff. He's got a decent build. He's wearing dark glasses. He's holding a cane. Are you Nanette? He says to the air. I shrug. Speak, he says. I open my mouth and swallow a fourth refill of peanuts. The vibes I get say, Snarky's on the level, but in the dark recesses of reality, my comfort zone is shattered by self-doubt. I grab my purse and, wedged in tight, I suck in my breath and attempt to maneuver myself out from between the table and the bench in what I can only describe as the beginning of a stampede and manage to take the whole table with me. Where are you going, Rusty asks as I blow by him, but I don't answer. I'm already out the door. Um, this next piece is a novel excerpt, a small excerpt from the novel and stories I'm working on called The Rock Star and the Girls Who Loved Him. It's um, a, a su succession of stories about, uh, interconnecting stories about a rock star in all stages of his career and the women in his life. And this one is called Freedom's Just Another Word, 1986. Megan tiptoed past her mother's bedroom. All she remembered that morning was a dark-haired woman screaming to get the hell out of her room. What a horrible daughter you are to wake me up and ask for that. 
the man who slept next to the screaming woman, would return home in a couple of hours, having just worked the night shift at a toothpaste factory. How ungrateful you are, screaming dark hair said, the bedroom air redolent with booze, the previous night's mascara, turning this banshee into a raccoon, for all we've given you. Whatever all we've given you was, it was a myth inside the screaming woman's head. Megan took what she needed. In the state her mother was in, she'd never miss the stolen cash. Megan didn't haul her 16-year-old self to sign into homeroom at her high school in Southern California that morning. She had other plans. I'm gliding through a cloud today, Megan thought. A trip to San Francisco, one seven hour and 45 minute drive to a world of freedom. Life awaited her and her dropout boyfriend. Maybe the chance to start her own band. She stood on a corner blocks from her house to wait for the navy blue Chevy to turn up. Captain Cody, horse, schoolboy, doors and fours, junk, pancakes and syrup, Miss Emma, monkey, Apache, smack, China girl, dance fever, toot, flake, brown sugar, tar, murder eight, vitamin R, tango and cash, kitty coke, kibbles and bits, jackpot, TNT, snow, blow, hillberry, hillbilly heroin, perks, perks, juice, and dillies. In lieu of SAT words, these were the words Megan would become familiar with for the next 21 years. It would be easy to recollect what happens in terms of years, because Megan was smart at math. 1970, Megan was born. 1980, Megan was 10. 10 was the year of awakening. She became smitten with Janis Joplin. 10 years after Janis's death, but not too late, nonetheless, Janis was her idol. The agony in her voice and how it correlated to making sense of her own world. Not in so many words, but the way Janice dragged herself above the pain. And not just her bluesy face smiling from her older sister's album covers. Something Megan seemed to have grown into, like Janice's rhythm, which became her reason for existence. All she wanted to do was to be like Janice. Janice this and Janice that as she listened to Janice come scratching out of her own cassette tapes. He was an hour late. And don't rush to get here. Megan decided she wasn't a tree. So she walked up and down the street, puffing on a cigarette, pretending she wasn't waiting for anyone. I'll wait 10 minutes more, 20, 40 minutes later. Oh, and her period was late too. Megan hated her boyfriend now. Where was he? She made a list in her notebook of all the wrong things he did she sh so she could keep on hating him. She needed someone she could transfer her leftover anger to. She walked to the newsstand and bought an issue of Rolling Stone magazine and a pack of gum. She read about a punk band she heard of but never listened to. That Johnny didn't beat his drum in the park anymore and Jimmy wasn't leader of any band. Tommy Ruthless killed it all. Their manager went out for a pack of cigarettes and never came back, all because of a shady record contract that was signed without being fully read. Shut the fuck up's band members went bankrupt. In years to come, in years to come, the reunion concert would fail, even though Megan's future boyfriend, who was now a famous rock star, was the star of the show. Tommy Ruthless would fuck it up again, and Jimmy would never get that operation he needed but whatever. Megan glanced at her watch. She walked to the nearest phone booth. She dialed, the ringing, no answer. She walked to the entrance of the motorway and stuck out her thumb. Okay, now I'm gonna read um, some poems from my forthcoming poetry collection, More the Moon, that's coming out the first week of November. And the first one's a sonnet called Postcard. Midnight bells to boom, and still the frayed maid sucking up to the moon, that nefarious stepmom, a fossil in limbo, sexually frustrated and envious me youth, nonetheless stunning. After all, she is a woman too. And I am mirrored in her face, alone and sublunary, as I am installed in this glossy rectangular space, the Alps, phlegmatic and polygynous as death, a comely myth this, 
No prince to smack my mouth betimes with sublime, superficial kiss or forced glass shoe, white flag and rack, bent in beam I scribe to you. Anyone this, I my bony shadow, my frick and frack. And this one is called Spring. It originally appeared in American Poetry Journal and then on Verse Daily as book poem of the day, Spring. Eyes done with no love to speak of, only the heart breaks in the right syllables. How would you chronicle that then? Dignity is a pig-headed groom pining for love at the altar of a season, but I'm competent enough to croon for the foolery of two, on standby in a green room waiting for flowers to end. I employ a clock of dying leaves right on cue to applaud spring out of its trite misery. Spring. Spring sewn into the meadow like a million billowing buttons yellowing a ride of stalks. Come split this room with me. Life is a too, too long script of floral pleas. A second coming would arrive in disguise. Might be a mightier one if I were in need of redundant pungency. Trees are a rumor ushering in bruised fruit. The air, punctured with wind chimes, smarts the perfumed apparatus with perfidious tidings. Winter. Winter, what have you nominated, causing no sentiment or untaught fling? The fluted crime of greenery pumping a gasket, uncalled for, this unabashed impinging. This is called Conclusion of the Stone Bard. Um, it's another sonnet, first appeared in Cincinnati Review. In the end, I was anyone's gym crack, stung and marginalized by moon flaw. A time I rose like knot grass in the raw night. Discourse drizzled from my tongue like all seed, fertilizing the unequivocal rent that divided my ignorance from her light. Huntress cast a muzzle against my voice again. Acumen doesn't come accidental twice. I digested her lies in acrid feast of doom. Her garden became a sick bay for the wit as I, monolith in limbo, was a perfect fit for her jealous nature that characterizes moon. In retrospect, I was the chosen bait for her charade, her false beams to falsify my fate. And I'm gonna end um, with a new poem that uh, I'm currently working on a new poetry manuscript, and this is from that. It's called In Some Cafe on the Upper West Side. She said she'd never sleep with a man she'd known less than six months. She's afraid she'll bruise the Virgin Mary, she said, and all she'd been taught in a plaid skirt. It wouldn't be smart to talk about first dates, I thought, or the fact that life's too short. So I ordered a dirty martini. She drank holy water from a paper cup. Who hasn't died of ecstasy one time or another? You know what I'm talking about. Later, the sun broke through clouds, and I took the F train to the Lower East Side. She hopped in a taxi to her flight to JFK, or maybe to Newark, I wasn't sure, back to the West Coast. I thought of Van Gogh and what he once said, something about dying of passion and I'd rather and boredom. And I assembled a poem and sent it to myself by text and read it on stage to a lively crowd in a dim and happening place. Thank you.